Um, many of you know Saigo already is the director of the Center for Tropical Crops and Biocommodities at uh, the Queensland University of Technology, QUT. And uh, before that, he was um, a senior executive in the Queensland Department of Primary Industry. Uh, he's uh, originally from South Africa. Um, he uh, was educated at uh, University of Cape Town, uh, or he was actually a faculty member at the University of Cape Town and chief executive officer of Africa's National Innovation Center um, of Agricultural Biotech. Uh, he did his PhD at Auburn University in, uh, uh, in the U US, and uh, he was a Fulbright Scholar while he was there. Um, he's a member of the African Academy of Sciences and also a member of the National Biotechnology Advisory Council uh, in uh, South Africa. So we're very pleased that Saiga has been able to step in. Uh, he's got a really exciting talk that he would have only had half an hour to present and now he's got a bit longer. Nutrigenomics, bridging the gap between genomics and health. Saiga. It's my first visit to uh, Saskatoon, and I must say that I've really been impressed with what I've experienced for the last couple of days, let alone the huge time difference between Australia and uh, Canada. So it gives me great pleasure and honor to talk to you about a concept called Nutrigenomics, Bridging the Gap Between Agriculture and Health. Now, I put this particular photograph uh, of the rooftop of Africa, which is Mount Kilimanjaro, that I had the opportunity of summiting when I turned 40 12 years ago, as uh, a segue to say that this entire concept was actually conceived by a close colleague of mine, uh, Apollo Ned Jikeng, the former director of the Biosciences Eastern Central Africa Hub, who is now at the Roslyn Institute in Edinburgh. He had arrived in Brisbane in November 2015 at around about early hours of a Sunday morning. I fetched him at early hours of Sunday and took him for a trek. And while we were trekking, we thought about what are some of these grand challenges that we should be focusing our attention on. And before we knew it, we had a concept note already developed by Monday. We shared that with a colleague, uh, Professor Iqbal Parker from the International Center for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology, which is the Cape Town component. And we put in a proposal to ICGEB for 25,000 euros to host a workshop in Cape Town. And we brought along a whole range of folk from animal nutritionists, human nutritionists, all the way through to companies that were going to deliver these technologies to address some of the key issues associated with health. And that occurred in September 2016. We are currently working and editing a book, uh, and I'm going to share with you uh, some of the further developments that have occurred around this year. So here we go, Nutrigenomics, Bridging the Gap Between Agriculture and Health. The structure of my presentation is that I will just shed a bit of context, the background uh, associated with this particular topic, identify some of the thematic issues that have been emerging at this particular forum around this burgeoning uh, global population that we need to start to think very strategically on how we are, we are going to address, and where this nutrition and genomics intersect that we are referring to as nutrigenomics, and what are some of the strategies that we are utilizing in Queensland and I'll draw on the experience and partnerships that I have with industry partners, and then uh, end up with referring to an example from South Africa, from an Umbumbulu community that works on indigenous agriculture. So, arising out of the conversation that I told you occurred in Cape Town, uh, a World Food Alliance was created and signed off last year at Bio, which is uh, a major conference that occurred in San Diego. And these are some of the key proponents, largely advocacy groups such as the Manitoban Agri-Health Research Network, Life Sciences Queensland, Africa Bio, and Genome Prairie, largely to help drive uh, what we refer to as integrated scientific approaches towards dealing with absolutely global health issues through ag innovation, and more or less also validating some of the nutritional claims that are often made where the consumer is becoming much more pedantic about does this really produce or this, does this yogurt actually have the live bifidobacterium that it professes to have so that I'm paying the premium price for what I'm getting or rather than just having the plain yogurt that actually has got probably more uh, probacteria in it. And also to look at how we can target these traits 
del delivering it to farmers, consumers, and in a very environmentally sustained manner. These are the foundation partners that cuts across these continents, North America, Africa, as well as Australia. But in no way is it limited to that, and we have started this process of engagement and already have a few projects funded, uh, and you can see some of the funding agencies listed there. Well, for those of you that haven't had the opportunity of uh, traveling to Queensland, uh, we are in the northeastern part of Australia, and as most of my colleagues say, two and a half size, two and a half types of Texas states will actually fit into Queensland. That's how vast it is. We've got a vast tropical, subtropical climate, and uh, a very supportive government, strong leadership. In fact, our premier Anastasia Palaszczuk is the longest-standing uh, female uh, premier or governor in Australia. What we find is that, if I may just go back to this, is that we essentially have access to the Asian markets. So often, a lot of what we focus on is really on trying to get products and helping to address the challenges and opportunities that exist in that region. Again, uh, QUT is uh, a city-based campus. We are actually located right alongside the city of Brisbane. This is the botanical gardens, right? And you could see the Brisbane River meandering across the city. We have got two major campuses, a Calvin Grove campus and a Gardens Point campus. Often I have what I call meetings on the walk, where I take my team, sit down in my office, and then we go for a walk through the botanical gardens, discussing key aspects, returning to the office, agreeing on what we have agreed to do, and then you find that some of the most productive conversations have occurred there. We have a very prolific science and engineering uh, center, which uh, basically houses the Institute for Future Environments that I, the center that I lead falls under. What I wanted to highlight here is that we have a phenomenal amount of central analytical capability that allows us to do and deal with those issues that I'm going to be raising today, and that is assessing the nutritional properties and validating these as well. The center focuses on a range of tropical crops that are of importance to Queensland, and these include bananas, uh, sugarcane, legumes, which is what I'm going to be focusing on, as well as other key crops like sorghum, cassava, and rice and cotton as well. The focus of our center's efforts is largely around the development of resilient as well as nutritious crops. And uh, we, one of our projects on bananas, led by my colleague, distinguished Professor James Dale, in 2015, 14, was identified as one of the top 25 innovations in the world by Time magazine. So let's return to the conversation that Ed has very kindly set the fantastic foundation for us. And that is, if you take a look at the population growth that occurred between 1960 and 2000, we saw a doubling of the population, and FAO stated that food production had to be doubled in order to be able to address that growing need. And the prediction is that by 2050, the world population will be 9.8 billion. And as you could see, it requires an increase in food production of up to approximately 60%. And what we see is that there's some major constraints associated with food production, one of which being abiotic stress. Now, I use these in many presentations because it actually captures some of the key thematic areas that are affecting food production globally. And these are terms that I picked up when I was at an agribusiness conference about four years ago, where I sat down and looked and listed all the key concepts that were being raised and challenges. And every time it was referred to, I put a tick alongside it, and then I took this, gave it to one of my graduate students, put it into word cloud, and this is what came out of it. So in essence, if you look at global agriculture, these are some of the major challenges and opportunities that we see. And the points that I would like to emphasize on here is we are seeing a consumer culture where there's a greater emphasis on actually what we call provenance, trying to understand exactly where your food comes from, what is its composition, and is it really delivering the health benefits that we are professing to have. We're also seeing the fact that there's a massive amount of urbanization that's occurring globally. And this is not just in the developed world, but also in the developing world, where you're dealing with a bubble wrap generation 
that prefers to have access to technology platforms like internet access, etc. So it has resulted in major migration to city centers. And that itself has put huge pressures on are we able to create and produce the foods where it is needed. And hence, it opens up many opportunities as well. Now, the other major challenge is really, and this was highlighted by Ed as well, the uh, unavailability or reduct, re reducing amount of arable land. Now, you saw a fantastic graph of, uh, or a photograph or map of Queensland, which, as I said, in, a, in many ways represents the food basket from a tropical and subtropical point, not just for uh, Australia, but for the region. But yet, it's only 1% of the area of Queensland that's actually arable. So you could imagine the challenging environment that the farmers are actually dealing with. So you could see here that as the population growth is increasing, that you're seeing a very steady decrease in the amount of arable land represented here hectares per person. So this is really uh, a challenge that I think we cannot afford to neglect but to put onto our radar. As an avid trekker, uh, in 2012, I led a team that actually spent 12 days trekking in the Annapurna range of Nepal. So these are just photographs that I had taken. One of the things that we did was that amongst these executives that I took along uh, on this particular trip, I said, we are going to be staying in tented accommodation and we'll eat only what is available in each of the villages. And it was very evident because of the fact that you were not getting the rainfall in the times and seasons that were expected, that sometimes we were just having rice and probably a pulse for dinner. This actually is an example of where climate change is having huge impacts on the livelihoods of people. And for those of you that are familiar with the term Annapurna in Sanskrit, it means crops in abundance. And this is far from what we saw on the ground, actually. I took this photograph here in 2015 in uh, a city called Coimbatore, which is in the southern part of India, the rice belt. And my colleague, who is now late, uh, Professor Robin, the head of the Department of Rice, took me into the field. I pulled out my phone and took this photograph. In 2015, Coimbatore, or the southern parts of India, did not get the monsoon rains at the time that they expected. And it threw the entire region into food insecurity. And this is, again, a, a reality and a challenge that we need to be smarter on how we are managing our environments. So the, arising out of all of these challenges, we have seen over the past day that we have been listening to talks that there are huge opportunities by way of advances that are occurring in terms of the omics and a range of tools. For those of you that were at yesterday's session on uh, genome editing, it was mind-blowing what can be done, what has been done, and what is going to be done. And these are tools and technologies that we need to start to see how we could utilize in order to be able to deal with this nexus that we call nutrition and genomics intersecting. We also need to look at personalized diets. How is it that we could now start to deal with the huge challenge of cardiovascular diseases? which, by the way, is quite agnostic to whether you come from a developed or developing part of the world. And this is largely because of changes in lifestyle. We are now become, we are no longer performing the amount of physical activities that our forefathers did, but yet we are consuming the calorie intake, which is almost equivalent to what was consumed hundreds of years ago. So we need to look at ways in which we can utilize tools that we are referring to as nutrigenomics to be able to help develop the profile of crops that will be able to satisfy those needs. So in effect, what we are seeing here is really a range of tools and advances that are occurring that I believe we need to put onto the forefront in order to be able to help deal with. And I'm going to give you some tangible examples of what we are doing at Queensland University of Technology in partnership with a range of companies and uh, industry partners. At the same time, we need to be aware that we are actually dealing with a generation that has become quite conscious and aware of what they are consuming. I've got two daughters, a 17-year-old and a 14-year-old. Whenever we go out shopping, uh, I see much greater attention to the sugar content, where is this product being produced. And this is something that I think we need to be cognizant of. If we are going to now expect that there's going to be traditional consumptions of foods, we are actually in for a surprise. 
I also do believe that the challenges associated with malnutrition and disease prevention, uh, particularly associated with a range of inflammatory or inflammation of the body, has become a huge issue globally that we need to start to pay attention to. We have also seen that with the increased population growth, there's also been economic prosperity. And people are becoming, and the consumers are becoming much more picky and choosy as to where and what they are consuming. And I think we need to be mindful of the fact that in helping to deal with these issues, we need to be able to deliver benefits that the consumers would be able to enjoy. So we see with the growing economies of Asia and rising income that there's definitely a huge increase in, plant, in a demand for plant-based proteins. And particularly if you look at in Asia, the demand for pulse-based products has been just phenomenal. And I'll present to you some economic data associated with that. If you use uh, the Indian subcontinent, or India specifically as an example, India produces probably around about 25 million tons of pulses per annum. Uh, and in addition to that, 5 million tons is actually imported. And this itself will tell you that this is actually a huge opportunity for folks like Canada as well as in Australia that actually grows a, a, a range of these products. We do find that there is a necessity to actually socialize pulses into Western diets. While Australia produces a significant amount of these pulses, about 95 to 98% of it gets exported. And for a person who consumes pulses almost on a day-to-day -day basis, I find that a lot of what I consume was probably produced in Australia, sent abroad, value added, and then brought back. And we are looking at ways in which that value addition can occur locally and create economic wealth as well. So what are pulses? These are legumes with dry edible seeds, and these are just a range of examples of them. My interest is largely around chickpea, mung bean, faba bean, as well as pigeon pea. Okay, so why pulses? As I indicated, there's definitely huge economic opportunities. And I think we must be cognizant and mindful of the fact that if we are going to progress and advance the development of these nutrient-rich, bioavailable, uh, micronutrient bioavailable pulses and other crops, we need to be able to see where the economic opportunities will present itself to get industry involvement as well. Clearly, there's huge health benefits. Uh, the availability or a source of protein uh, the source of vitamins such as folate, which is needed for the neural development of children and also for women, have become huge topics of conversation globally. And as you heard from Ed, the issue around soil health is a critical component in this. And we know that pulses are nitrogen fixes and are able to actually reduce our dependency on nitrogen fertilizers as well. This is some data from uh, a colleague who is the former president, uh, chairman of the board of uh, Pulse Australia, who has gathered this data, as you could see, since 2005. What it essentially is showing us is that you can look at the production of pulses in India over this period of time, and take a look at the consumption and the significant increase, and this increase in the gap of what India cannot actually provide. And while there's lots of systems that have been put into place to encourage that, we must be mindful that there are limitations. These changes in climatic conditions, the unavailability of arable land or reducing availability of arable land is actually creating these challenges, but at the same time, opportunities. So I'm going to talk about the R&D program that we have at QUT, particularly around chickpea. And you'll notice that there are two major varieties of chickpea, the desi variety, which is a brown, smaller uh, grain and the slightly larger grain, which is the Kabuli variety, utilized quite significantly in the Mediterranean region. And then we look at uh, what we refer to as the green pearl, or mung bean, widely consumed in the Indian subcontinent as well as in Asia. Okay? If those hadn't triggered or rang a bell in your uh, minds, these are just some of the products of chickpea, starting off with falafel, they're often used in salads, uh, hummus, Chana, da, chana curry, as well as uh, chapati and uh, flour that's produced from it. And these are just some of the products that you get from mung bean, starting out with your papadum, sprouts, noodles, your moon cake, as well as these are the other uh, ways in which it's actually consumed. Now, 
If you take a look at the economic opportunity within Australia, particularly uh, in terms of exports, as you could see, the majority of our products actually gets exported to the Indian subcontinent, as well as in the Middle East and parts of Asia as well. And this is for chickpea. And if you take a look at mung bean exports, again, largely to the Indian subcontinent as well as the Middle East. And very little actually gets into Europe as well as North America. Now, what we have seen over a period, particularly in Queensland, is that there's been a significant increase in the adoption and growing of these pulses. Why? Because there were certainly economic drivers that have led to that. And if you take a look at chickpea particularly, in 2014, for the first time in the history of Queensland, it ended up being Queensland's top grain. In fact, uh, chickpea contributed 441 million at farm gate to the economy of Queensland. And mung bean, which for decades was referred to as mongrel bean, has now been, there's a term called money bean that has been coined. Because at, as of the last season, it was fetching up to $1,400 a ton without any value addition. And this is really at farm gate. So we are looking at ways in which, while we have got prolific export markets, what is it that we can do to actually create this additional value so that it, did, it delivers these health benefits that we are referring to particularly? Okay, so I'm gonna share with you uh, uh, some examples of what we are doing. And as you could see, uh, the strategies in bridging this gap between agriculture and health cannot be looked at in isolation from the challenges of growing crops. So we have a firm program that's looking at how do we improve the resilience of these crops. Why? Because if you have, for some reason or the other, an increase in temperature up to about 37, 40 degrees Celsius at flowering, you could actually completely lose a crop. So developing such levels of resilience actually gives us at least a crop to harvest and then we could look at the other traits that I've been talking about. I do believe that we need to look at what I call the gems. If we are enhancing all along this value chain, the genetics in order for to be, to be able to enhance the ability of these plants to produce nutritious products, we need to look at what environments are they best grown in. And more importantly, what sort of management practices need to be put into place? How much of soil moisture do we need to have in the soil? What sort of soil profile do we need to have in order to be able to ensure that we have a successful crop? We are fortunate in Australia, we have a vast uh, tropical, subtropical climate with sunshine most of the year. But I'm aware that in North America, as well as in Europe, you have literally almost a finite 90 to about 120 days. And if for some reason, things change in terms of you didn't get enough rain or your winter has been extended, it could have a huge and catastrophic impact on whether you're going to get a successful crop or not. So we have a strong capability in whatever we do in looking at this triumvirate, which is really what is it, where exactly can we grow a successful crop, and we can do that by these crop modeling tools. And I will talk about our strategies uh, in chickpea and how we have actually improved the nutritional profile of chickpea. We have also, while we are using genetic modification, genome editing as current tools, we're also mindful that we need to enhance the diversity, enhance the rich diversity, particularly in genetics, by drawing on largely what is existing in the wild. And I'll give you an example of what we have been doing with mung bean in setting up a nested association mapping population. I will not get a chance to talk about these plant probiotics, but in essence, as you are aware, our health and, and the health of animals is guided and dictated largely by the microflora that exists in our gut. In fact, there's many uh, papers that say that there are more bacterial cells in our body than actual human cells. Now, the, what we see is that in plants, there's equally uh, what we refer to as an, an endophyte community. We were able to isolate a range of these endophytes and we believe that these endophytes could actually deliver not just stress resilience, but also uh, uptake of certain micronutrients and deliver to the seeds. And we are in the process of undertaking some field trials to demonstrate that because our glasshouse experiments has been very promising. Okay, so this work here on 
enhancing the nutritional profile of chickpea was undertaken by my PhD student Grace Tan and my postdoc Milan Wong. From, uh, Grace is from Singapore and Milan is from uh, Vietnam. Okay. I had the opportunity uh, in 2015 of uh, attending a meeting in, in India at ICGEB and guess what? On the front page of the Times of India was this particular article which talked about the high percentage or incidence of uh, anemia in, in, in India, particularly amongst women. And it said that 59% of the women are severely anemic. And uh, that's a very significant uh, uh, number to actually uh, be dealing with. Now, why is iron such an important issue you know, for women's health and men's health in general? We know, particularly in men's, uh, women's health, uh, we know that it actually has poor pregnancy outcomes, it affects the cognitive development of infants, it impairs immunity and definitely increases morbidity. And the result is that we see a loss of productivity as well as huge healthcare costs. Now, this particular map was uh, generated uh, and from a publication in 2016. And it shows a color metric picture of the world. And if there's anything that stands out is that iron deficiency across the world, and often iron deficiency is associated with zinc deficiency as well, is quite agnostic as to whether you are from a developed or a developing part of the world. In fact, even in a country like Australia, we do see between 0 to 10 percent of uh, the population being anemic. But take a look at you know, the Indian subcontinent and large parts of Africa. So we believe that while there are a number of strategies in place to help deal with uh, anemia, and particularly iron deficiency, we need to find ways in which we can actually help deal with this in a very proactive manner. So if you take a look at pulses, but particularly chickpeas specifically, chickpea is renowned to have much higher iron content. In fact, it's quite variable, but it ranges between 3 and 11 milligrams per 100 grams. But the challenge is that it's only 5 to 25 percent of this that's bioavailable. Most of it is actually locked in proteins, and while you might be consuming these thinking that you're getting as much out of it as possible, the reality is that it's not. In fact, the recommended daily in intake of iron for men, uh, males is 8 milligram, and for females it's 18. Now, what are some of the strategies that are in place currently to deal with this? We know that the dietary diversification is an important mechanism. We also have seen considerable amount of supplementation that occurs. You walk into an average home, uh, it's almost uh, a mini pharmacy with a range of supplements that we are taking, assuming that these things are actually going to be absorbed by our body. And a lot of this is guided and dictated by the microflora in our gut. Food fortification, where during the processing of food, we see the addition of iron in different forms. And these are some of the more innovative approaches that we could use uh, through breeding, genetic modification, as well as genome editing. And we have been delving in the space of genetic modification and have also identified a genome editing strategy. Now, if you take chickpea seeds and you split them in the center and use this pearls Prussian blue, to determine where the iron is localized, it's actually quite surprising. The iron, the largest quantity of the iron that's present there is actually localized right at the embryo. And the cotyledons actually have very little of it. So during the processing of these seeds, you often find that the embryos actually fall off. So we have the strategy that we have adopted is really how do we increase the content of iron in chickpea but at the same time increase the bioavailability okay, in terms of its localization. From the literature, it's quite evident. There's two major components of iron uptake and storage that's important. And these involve uh, NAS, nicotinamine synthase 2, as well as the iron-regulated transporter and the ferrodoxin uh, reductase and oxidase, and then the role of ferritin. So we have carried out a study where we have looked at a range of the combinations of these and put them back into chickpea to see whether it had any major effect on iron content and bioavailability. In fact, we have established a very efficient transformations platform for chickpea. And working closely with my colleague, uh, uh, Professor T.J. Higgins, 
we have set up what I would quite confidently say is one of the highest transformation efficiencies, uh, at least to the labs that we know are involved in this. We have got up to 3.4% success rate in transforming of chickpea. In fact, over the past four years, we have done up to 200,000 transformations to be able to get enough material that allows us to assess this. And as you could see from this, uh, we split the chickpea seeds, injured them by a needle, <coughs> exposed them to the agrobacterium containing our gene of interest. Another important step here is that because it's difficult to root uh, the chickpea in tissue culture, we micrograft them. It's almost like microsurgery. And uh, this is really, and the success rate of our micrografting is about 90, 95%. And before we know it, we actually have you know, the, uh, the T1, uh, T0 uh, uh, plants, and then we collect seed, and we've got them up to about T4, which is the fourth generation. Yesterday, it was quite evident from the session on genome editing, we could utilize these advanced technologies only if and when we are able to actually manipulate these in plant systems. And often you find that pulses are difficult to actually transform. And I'm sure Dr. Kiran Sharma, who is in this room here, will tell you that, having worked on transformations of a range of these pulses, that it's not trivial. So we now have carried out a whole range of analyses of material that were generated from this transformation process. And as I said, using NAS and ferritin, we've seen the, the most significant effect. So this is just the validation uh, of the fact that we had single copies and insertions in these genomes, and they were homologous, so which allowed us to then go ahead and assess these. Uh, these are still early days, but what we have seen is that the uh, NAS levels were actually quite high compared to the controls. And when we went ahead and looked at the iron concentrations, in this case in the leaves, we could see a significant difference. So it's, so far it shows a tremendous amount of promise that we, were able to, we are able to generate chickpea plants that not just have higher iron content, but the bioavailability of it is also there. We have what is called the laser ablation, inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometer, which allows us to run a laser beam across these seeds within about 10 seconds. And it will give you an elemental analysis and literally almost to accuracies that is actually mind blowing. So we could screen literally hundreds of these in a very short space of time. So in, for this particular section, and just to summarize, uh, I just emphasize that iron deficiency, a huge issue globally, and I think it's something that requires innovative approaches to dealing with. Uh, we have adopted a three-pronged strategy to increase the iron uptake, transport, and storage, and we have seen three to five-fold increase in iron accumulation. So let me shift gears a bit to this mung bean nested association mapping population. Again, uh, what the, P the individuals that have been driving this year is Tom Noble, a PhD student of mine, and the only mung bean breeder of Australia, Cole Douglas, who has been working closely with us, and Cole is from the Queensland Department of Agriculture and Fisheries. Now, you've already been introduced to NAM because Ed talked about this earlier on, but in effect, what we have done is that we have taken mung bean breeding into the 21st century. We have seen that there are only specific varieties that are being utilized globally, and there was a need to enhance and improve the genetic diversity. So what we did is that we invested in uh, identifying and collecting 560 accessions from across the world, from Africa, North America, Asia, as well as within Australia. We went ahead and sequenced all of these and identified uh, 70,000 SNPs. We then went ahead and did a diversity array of these to identify what are the conglomerates of genetic diversity. And we used 24 as donors in crossing those with the current variety that's used in Australia, which is also commonly used in other parts of the world. In doing so, we, through single seed descent, have set up what we call a nested association mapping population that pictorially looks like this. Okay? where you could see these 24 diverse donor lines crossed with the commercial variety, and this is the richness of the genetic diversity. While we have invested in this in Australia, we have made it available to the global sector. So it's already deposited in the World Vegetable Center in Taiwan, and within Australia it's used quite extensively. Why? 
because it's a fantastic repository to allow us to now screen for material that has higher protein content, higher folate levels, much greater bioavailability uh, bio of iron, zinc, etc. And in addition to that, the other challenges that I talked about, which is disease pressure, uh, abiotic stresses, we can now start to phenotype these. So in effect, what we are looking at is how we can accelerate using really smart breeding strategies to accelerate the identification of traits, particularly to deliver to the consumer. And these are just uh, field trials that we have done in uh, Hermitage or Warwick, which is uh, about uh, an hour and a half's drive from Brisbane. This is Tom Noble uh, working uh, actually at a field day with the farmers who had come out to actually see these diversity of you know, the NAM population and some of the uh, screening that we have been undertaking. We, the strategy here really is that if we are thinking of developing products that have such nutritional profiles, we need to start at the value chain where it matters. And that is really the genetic material that we are working with. And in doing so, it's important to be able to socialize this with the growers. Because if we don't get buying from the growers, this will just end up in a seed bank where it's being stored. So we work with companies that are interested in making products from these that know that these are some of the market drivers that's driving these products. And this gives us an opportunity to identify uh, them quite early on. So in this particular case, the use of the NAM population has been just phenomenal. It has created a rich diversity that allows us now to be able to sustain this particular diversity to screen for a range of traits that we're looking for. We know that from this progeny, we can now start to phenotype and genotype it using all these advanced technologies that we have been hearing about in the last day or two. And we are now in the process of actually screening them for higher protein content, better nutritional profiles, disease resistance, and drought tolerance. And in doing so, helping to drive what we call to address the health issues through the strategy of nutrigenomics. So, I would now like to shift gears and talk about the part of the value chain where we start to get products developed. And I work closely with a range of companies, but particularly a company called Foods from the Earth, which is based in Brisbane, that are actually looking at how we could now innovate and actually develop products that are targeting specific sectors. And in this particular case here, uh, we are looking at uh, the development of products which are actually have no nut allergy in it. So as you would imagine, uh, nut allergy, like in Australia and many parts of the world, in Australia we have three in every 100 children that's actually, that has a peanut allergy. So in an average school, you're not allowed to take any peanut products because there's the possibility that someone who's got a peanut allergy could be severely affected from this. So we believe that we can deliver health benefits to the end users through high protein, nutrient, and vitamin rich products. Now, I can just get to the next slide. There is, because of the fact that in Western society, there is a misperception that there are lots of anti-nutritional properties of pulses. Uh, and issues such as digestive issues, uh, the beanie flavor has become a huge impediment towards the adoption of these pulses. And uh, this particular company, working with them, have developed a, pro a spread called Not Nuts which is basically uh, targeting school kids, uh, very high in terms of protein content, folate, and other uh, micronutrients. And it has been an absolute hit. And you can walk into most supermarkets in Australia and be able to pick this product up. So we've used a three-pronged strategy here. And as I said, looking at genetic material and then how we can productize these and socialize these into diets. We have focused on digestive health. We have been able to validate with scientific evidence that, you know what, pulses are an important prebiotic that actually allows us to be able to encourage probiotics to grow in our gut. We also looked at the protein content and not just that, the amino acid profiles. Amino acids such as tryptophan, quite important for the, uh, as a precursor for serotonin, which is important for brain development. And then the other components like minerals and vitamins as well. So, Three weeks ago, we released our first crisp. It's called a faba bean chip. It's now available in all the supermarkets. Uh, what we did is, is that my team formulated what was the inclusion rate of the actual pulse 
to be able to deliver a health benefit. So when you eat a packet of this or some of these crisps, you know that you will take in a certain amount of protein content, etc. We must be mindful of the fact that we're dealing with a generation that's looking for convenience. What are some of the snack foods that we could prepare that allows us to be able to deliver that? So on this particular front, all that I could say is that uh, we are looking at targeting a range of products. We are currently working with uh, the team to develop a breakfast biscuit that's targeted at aged care that has a protein and vitamin and micronutrient profile that if you have a biscuit a day, you could literally be able to replace the sustagen which most folks are actually taking. And we are working with our faculty of health in order to be able to demonstrate that. Okay? This last couple of slides, uh, this is the Umbumbulu community that I talked about uh, that for generations have been growing a type of potato called uh, madumbes. In growing up in South Africa, uh, because potatoes were quite expensive, this is what we used in our curries. And unbeknown to us that it has lower GI and it has far higher content of resistant starch and other nutritional benefits. So when I was the CEO of Plant Bio, South Africa's National Innovation Center for Ag Biotech, we set up an R&D program to be able to assist this community to be able to identify uniform germplasm that they could essentially promote and to be able to connect them to an industry partner, which in this particular case was Woolworths. To cut a long story short, you could walk into any Woolworths store in South Africa and most of the Mudumbes there come from the Umbumbulu community, which is driven largely by women. So, I'll leave you with this uh, three-legged African pot, which is uh, basically saying that I think these partnerships are really quite significant in order for us to be able to deliver these significant benefits to society. And we need to look at the entire supply chain, from the identification of germplasm to what are the issues that we are going to be dealing with, not just today, but in the future. I had the opportunity in 2014 of spending uh, 20 minutes with Prime Minister Narendra Modi in a glass house talking about the work that we are doing. I was amazed. Every quarter, our Deputy Vice Chancellor gets a letter from his office asking for an update on when are we going to deliver the higher bioavailable iron and higher protein content chickpeas. And I think his point was that if we could deliver a benefit to the consumer, the consumer is quite happy to inject the insulin into their bodies, mindful of the fact that it has come from whatever technology that has been used. If we deliver a health benefit, it will be a game changer. These are my team members that have contributed to this project, and these are the industry partners that we have collaborated with. And you heard yesterday from Fayaz Kazi, we have established a very strong partnership with LO Life Systems, where they will be co-located at QUT to use genome editing to accelerate the delivery of these benefits. And that is nutrigenomics, bridging the gap between agriculture and health. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.